one morning we got we got to the camp was woke up with the news that uh, DD had arrived without the first airborne division. Now, from then that time onwards, we was moved to aerodromes in the south of England, ready to go and uh, do what was necessary. And we was briefed and briefed and briefed. I think it was about 14 operations, and for one reason or other, 14 operations cancelled. We was then briefed for this place in Holland. None of us had ever heard of this place called Arnhem. The, the, the idea was that uh, there'd be three airborne divisions dropped in that part of Holland, two American and one us. We was the farthest away from the nearest friendly troops, and our job was to in general, was the, the bridge at Arnhem. Once that had been captured, then you, the gateway to Germany was more or less open. All the German troops in North Holland would be cut off, and uh, once they got over the other side, a place called Driel, where the Poles landed, was, uh, you swung east and you're in the Ruhr Valley. Capture the Ruhr Valley and you've captured all the industrial parts of Germany. Now, the general said if this would have happened, the war could have been over by Christmas, whether that would have been so, because we knew once the Germans got back into Germany on their own land, they'd, they'd fight more than ever to save their own land, naturally. Now, 16th of September, oh, one other thing I should have told you, when the, an operation's cancelled, the, the code word is Fabian. And every in the early hours of the morning, somebody would open your billet door and shout Fabian. That meant we wouldn't go in. And this particular night, the 16th of September, the word Fabian never arrived. Early breakfast, we knew then the, we, it was on. And uh, we was all then, uh, was took down to the separate aerodromes. And uh, from there, we embarked about uh, maybe half past nine. When, it, when we did embark, it must have been a, a sight for sore eyes to see this massive convoy of gliders alone, being escorted by, I think it was about 900 fighter planes. So it must have been a terrific sight to see this. Now, I'm not sure where we crossed the English Channel, but we crossed and we was fired on by a, a German uh, they had boats, but just were I can't. But within seconds, when I say we were fired on, I meant the convoy, and they shot this, I watched them shooting it up. So we crossed the course with the, the part of the course we crossed, the, you could see that all the ground was flooded. The Germans had flooded, it's just, because they knew that sooner or later that somebody would be coming that way. And uh, I think then about uh, maybe another hour's flight, We'd reached the landing zones at uh, round uh, Arnhem, and then the order came. We cast; they were casting us off. And uh, there's a psychiatric hospital round Wolfhazer somewhere. And I remember we was dropped and landed quite safely there. And after about an hour, this huge sky was filled with parachute troops for what seemed a couple of hours, and. Uh, very little opposition, had we took the Germans by surprise? Well, we probably had. So well, then the idea of getting to the bridge then, it meant marching, I think it was about seven miles to the bridge, and the Germans must have realised what was what we, the object was, they probably knew that. And uh, now B Company of the 1st Battalion the Border went, we had to march through a little village called Wolfhazer, through Heelsome, and our job then was to form a, a barricade at this village of Rencom to stop any movement of German troops coming from the Vargany area. And it seemed more like a summer, summer exercise because it was a beautiful, sept typical September sun afternoon. And uh, what to, my job was to... Uh, get to the, the, the near the river bank where there was a ferry there at the other side and my job was to keep it covered. And uh, there was a brickworks there where we formed a barricade to uh, stop any movement. And uh, 
there was very little went on. We had booked in, uh, shot two or three German lorries up on the march to Rainham. But during the night, the Germans brought a force up, got between us and the division. Now we were shelled and mortared in the night time quite heavily. And uh, so I think about four o'clock the next afternoon, we've been under shell fire, machine gun fire and mortar fire, practically continuous. The d division said if the B company could get back and join the, the battalions, which were around the Oosterbeek area. Well, we didn't know what had been going We We thought, hopefully, that the bridge had been captured by then. I think after probably the second day, things started going sadly wrong then. The, the Germans held the south end of the bridge and the John Frost's men held the north end of the bridge and they held it, for, as you know, Westerbridge held it for three or four days and... Uh, so the object of catching the bridge was gone then. Nothing, nothing that they could do about it then. The Germans had brought big forces up. So it was a matter of us and the rest of the division trying to stop any German attacks on the mostly around Oosterbeek. And for the many days then, no, we had we'd lost our ration packs. It was a matter of beating off any attacks what come, not just us, all around the, the used to be courier. And uh, the, at, we, there was, the bad been told that probably we would be relieved within 48 hours. But the Germans formed a huge body of men, tanks and artillery. And the, the British Army, as it got to the, the bridge had been captured at Nijmegen, and that was about as far as they could get. So the Germans then had us in a, a pocket which they, they called the cauldron, and it were a mass of shelling us, mortaring us, machining us, attacking us, and it was on, on continually on the move. The, the next attack for B Company would become at the east of the south, of, of the west of us, and we was actually digging in, like digging in what they call the slit trench, and. Uh, a slit sense, the nearest I can describe to you, the Americans call them foxholes. The next, uh, the, as I said, it was more like this, if you can imagine a grave, it was more in the fashion of a grave, and in a lot of cases, it was a grave, because we were having men killed by an artillery shelling, mortaring and machine gunning and attacks. And uh, I think by the fifth day, I think most of us realised that uh, we was in a, in a hell of a mess then. Now, it might have been the fifth afternoon, we got to supplies dropped. Now, we had yellow triangular discs, which we could all out cloth, so, so the British uh, air crews knew we were there. But the landing the lands, the, the part of that land, as the supplies were dropped, the Germans had overrun it. And I didn't know this till we got back later, that uh, they thought the Germans had, had also knew that, about these triangles and they, they could, it, we could be them. So most of the panniers and parachute uh, doppings, the Germans got most of them. So... We were short of food, ammunition, and uh, supplies of any sort. And uh, they were shelling us continually, and uh, all you could do was stand in your slit tent, and as soon as the, the quietness stopped down, you knew then the next German attack would come. Now, in the direction of uh, Nijmegen again, there was a, a load of archer, and they were shelling in front of us to keep the German forces down, and they lost a lot of men besides us. And this went on and on and on, and uh, then we realised that the, the 21st Army Group should have relieved us. Well, we knew then that they was having a terrific battle to get to us, and uh, just couldn't get through. Every night they cut the 
the the the line as as the relief line to us, and uh, they couldn't get no farther. The the big bridge at Nijmegen had been captured, along with a lot of the other bridges, what the Americans were capturing, and. Uh, uh, people have asked me this, did you think what was going to happen to you? Well, I was convinced that uh, it was either being killed or took prisoner. Maybe the morale of the husband was very low. Now, other people have asked me, I knew there were a lot of wounded and killed, and I, I was fortunate. I, did you ever got, nearly get killed? Now, one incident I can remember quite clearly I was dug in this slit trench and the shells and mortar, they were going off all around you and I thought sooner or later one's, one's going to catch me. And this particular incident I'm telling you about, I can remember it quite plain, late afternoon, this shell must have landed right near me, probably yards away, and all I can remember was this terrific bang, biggest bang of the lot, and I just felt that somebody had squeezed my chest and was taking the breath out of me. Now, I didn't know that at the time, but I believe that's the blast what causes that, and it can suck the water out of your lungs and, and, and kill you. Now, I just felt this squeezing in my lungs, and I just felt that somebody had lifted me up in the air. Probably that was imagination, and that was all I remembered. Now, how long I was unconscious, I've no idea. And when I woke up, I didn't laugh about it at the time, of course, but when I lay up, I lay in the bottom of this slit tent and I felt my back's wet. I must have been it, but I can't feel no pain. And when what had happened, my water bottle on the rest of my equipment was on the top of the slit tent and this bit of a shell splinter, I hit my water bottle and the water was gurgling out and going on my back. So <laughs> I'm glad to say there was no blood. And uh, that was the nearest I've been to being killed. There was quite a lot of men being killed each day. I think the average was about 115 men a day were being killed. And... Uh, my platoon officer was still alive and he kept coming to give us instructions and we moved digging other slit tents where there were attacks and this went on and that, the cold and as the Germans have called it, uh, we've been squeezed in and in till I think the perimeter then was only about a quarter of a mile wide and maybe a mile in length. And uh, so what's going to happen? It was still, they were still shelling the mortar. And I think maybe after about seven or eight days, probably the Germans realised they had us in their pocket. Why lose troops attacking us when they could just shell the mortars to death? And maybe while they could contain us there, they could also kill the British Army troops coming to relieve us. Now, this Sunday, Mr. Royal Command, Lieutenant Royal Command, he said to me, all of them, the divisions had secret orders. The Canadian engineers, boat engineers, are trying to get us back on the south bank and taking us back to safety. He said, but it's going to be a very, very risky operation because the Germans had, at, uh, at the, the Arnhem end of the river, they had tanks, machine guns and artillery pieces to try and ready for if anybody tried to get across to us. And he said, now, I want to take you to this gap here. Now, he said, there, you'll be posted there when it comes dark. Now, he said, the division, there'll be tapes laid out before they get to you. That's the escape route. Now, he said, your job is to, when they get to you, near you, is to point out there was a brook between us and the Nedder Rhine, and he says there's a little footbridge there. Your job is to guide them, tell them where it is. And he said, and also, from the di Nijmegen direction, two Bofors guns will be firing two, phos two phosphorus shells up in line, in unison with each other, probably 500 yards apart, up in the air, 
And so long as they're between them two shells, tracer shells, they're in the right escape direction. And uh, so he said, then under no circumstances do you move from here. You, 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 you're under court martial if you get back to England for moving from here. And th this went on, of what I told him, telling troops which way to go and etc. And then about four o'clock in the morning, I thought, it's going to be another hour, it'll be coming daylight. So what's going to happen then? And out of the woods, now all of me said, how long has it since you saw the last troops go through? I said, it must be at least half an hour. He said, well, the majority of troops, apart from odds and sods, have probably got down to the river and over the other side. You've got my shoe cans, he said, you've got my permission to go down to the river. And they were shelling them parts. They kept dropping shells and mortar bombs round there. Now, when I got to the river, I thought there'd be somebody saying, where have you been? We've been waiting for you. And to my utter dismay on this sandbank, there was probably four, three, four hundred soldiers waiting to be crossed. And word went round there was only one boat left. The other mechanical faults had been sunk. So that was the end of it to me. It was either be killed or took prisoner. That were my thoughts again. And for reasons probably neither me or a corporal clerk never knew, he said to me, do, do you fancy swimming? Because some people had swam across. Now, the river looked about a quarter of a mile wide and flowing fast. I said, no, if I get in there, I know I'm going to drown. So you don't know. Well, he says, anything's better than standing here, waiting to be killed or took prisoner. And as I say, these things happen probably without your thinking. He said, well, let's walk down to the, down in the direction of the floor, see if we can find anything. Now, what we were supposed to be looking for, nobody knew. And we'd been joined by an officer, and I think about another dozen men, and after about ten minutes' walk, and we were in the German lines by then, of course, we found this boat. Probably it was a boat of this, these troops what had formed a, 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 a division, a diversion to make the Germans believe there were troops coming over. And uh, so this boat, he, there was four oars, and he said, uh, this officer said, can anybody... And Now, I did tell lies. I told him I could row, and I'd never rowed. I thought, well, at least if we get in the water safe, and we are sunk by shell fire, mortar fire, machine gun fire, or whatever, at least I've got something to float, as I could probably stick hold of. And... Uh, I'm glad to say we safely rode across, but we'd been washed down quite a bit, so we knew we was farther still in the German lines, and any time now it's going to be daylight, dawn were breaking. So what we did, we more or less waded in the muddy banks back in the direction of Arnhem, and out of the blue come this wonderful voice, come on lads, you're safe now. And there was a German, uh, a Canadian soldier was dug in there and he guided us which way to go. Early May 1946, that'd be, my demob number come up and uh, I was demobilised and by then I got married. I came home and uh, I, I was married and uh, in two, three years time I had two daughters and uh, I worked in one or two uh, places in the Rantliff area, where I live now, and uh, I got a job in a paper mill, and uh, I spent the rest of my time there, until uh, I took early retirement at 61, and uh, that's the end of my army service. Now, to end it on the note, I never went back to Arnhem, for 45 years, and it's too long a story to tell you how I came to be in Gate. And now, for 45, I never went back because, for, for one thing, how could you face these Dutch people? We got us conquering heroes, we give, especially Rankum, we give Rankum freedom for 24 hours, and there was, you can imagine the overwhelming joy they had. And after 24 hours, we pulled back to the battalion and left them to the German forces again. 
they would I thought they'll, they'll never forgive us. In fact, they want to string us up. And uh, as I said, it's too long a tale to. Now, I, I made myself a member of the Arnhem 1944 Veterans Club and the 1st Battalion Border and Old Comrades. And uh, I decided at 50, 45th anniversary that I would go back to Arnhem. So I did what had to be done. And uh, I, I bought a visitor's passport. You could then for one year, because I'd only go that once. And this is now. 2017, and God willing, I'm going back to Arnhem again this year, and I've been with the same family, the wonderful family, the Meduch family, and I can't tell you how kind and wonderful these people have been with me, and they've come here many times, and they are, they are Meduch family, and I've watched their two school children grow up. One works in London, one's out in Kuala Lumpur, and uh, instead of going for once, I've been back 26 times since. And naturally, by now, with the, as the newspapers call it, natural wastage, there's very, very few was left. In fact, uh, I think of the border regiment, there was only about four of us there this time. Now, somewhere out in this country of ours, there must be men, and I'm only talking about my own, but there must be men what, like me, I never went back for 45 years. They never wanted to go back. Probably now they're too ill to go or they've passed away. And, uh, and, and there's above 100 books been wrote about this battle. Probably it would have, it would have won the battle with about two or three pages in history books. Now, they can't, <laughs> up to this date, they're still writing books on it. And uh, I think now I've come to the end of the story. I hope I've not bored anybody watching this film or this uh, whatever you want to call it. And uh, that's briefly. My army history. And uh, I hope you've learned something from it. Well, on a closing note, could I say this? Don't think I, I go, we go back to Arnhem or any other part of the world where ex-soldiers go to glorify and think I was a soldier. It's nothing of the sort. The most terrible thing one nation can inflict on another is war. War is... Not like American films where only the baddies get killed. War is the most terrible thing that can happen. This Airborne Cemetery, first time I went, I stood at the back of a headstone, some soldiers I knew, and I thought then, I'd like to think in future years, there's no soldiers, ex-soldiers, would have to go to a place like this because there'd be no wars. But that's only a dream. It never happened. It looks as if the wildest people on this world will fight. In fact, I believe there's only two men left in this world who want to fight each other. So I'd like to close now wishing everybody a healthy and happy future. I'm 96, so I'm not, I can, I've overstayed my welcome, but uh, there you are. That's the story of uh, my army. I hope you've learned something from it. Thanks for listening and thanks for watching. And thanks for... My friend here has uh, done this filming, he's, uh, he's, he's had a lot of patience with me. Okay, bye now. <laughs>